Welcome back to the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame YouTube channel. We've got another great guest here today from Niagara Weefield, the one and the only longtime football coach, administrator, and Niagara County legislator, Bill Ross. Bill, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. I'm just glad to be here. You were you had the uh, dubious distinction of, of being the first coach of the Niagara Wheatfield program. How was it back then, or how did you get a program started off the ground like a varsity high school program started off the ground like you did? Well, it was certainly a difficult 1958 to get it off the ground because we opened the high school with the kids that were attending from NT, the seniors remain at NT, graduate from NT. The same as the Niagara Falls system. We had quite a few students there from the town of Niagara and uh, they were allowed to finish at Niagara Falls High School. And the kids in the Pekin area were allowed to finish at Wilson High School. So I started the program off with 26 uh, student athletes that wanted to be football players and uh, 24 of them were getting the first chance. I had uh, two of the players that played on the LaSalle JV the year before. So it was a, a new group, but what was, was difficult, we didn't have a feel behind the school. Really, when we opened the school in September of 58, several of the areas of the school inside were not completed, including the cafeteria, industrial arts, the gym, the swimming pool, and certainly outside, all we had was uh, three tennis courts and some backstops up for the phys ed classes. So I had to take the players by bus over to the Tuscarora Indian Elementary School, where they allowed me to use the field over there. So they traveled every day that first year over to Tuscarora School. That's where we practice. There were no uh, locker rooms over there. So the maintenance man gave us his maintenance shack. So the kids could uh, change in the maintenance shack and uh, there were no showers. So they would have to take themselves home and shower at home. A, a difficult, but they were an energetic group and they really wanted to build a football team. And we had some kids that uh, from that first team that made out very well later on, John Lachance uh, was one that went on to junior college and then finished at what's known as Texas Tech today. And uh, there were several others that uh, went on and played a little division three football when they graduated, but it was difficult. But uh, the, these student athletes, the football players didn't complain. They were glad to have a team. They were glad to be playing. And we did have four games the first year. Uh, we played two JVs and we played two varsity teams. And actually they did uh, very well. They won all four games. So the uh, these first uh, pioneers, football players at uh, Niagara Wheatfield did very well. I'm still proud of them. I've lost a lot of them over the years. They passed away, but uh, they'll always be in my heart as long as I live. When did you join the Niagara Frontier League? When did Niagara Weefield join the Niagara Frontier League? 1965. Lackawanna dropped out. Lackawanna went back to the ECIC. Niagara Weefield came in at that time. And the coach at that time for Niagara Weefield was a gentleman by the name of Robert Yerge, who left Weefield in 70, went to Williamsville South and won three championships in the early 70s. But... Uh, as I say, uh, Lackawanna was an original member of the Niagara Frontier League when it was formed in 1937. So when they dropped, Niagara Wheatfield took their spot. So who were your opponents between that 1958 season and, and 1964? Who were you playing? Uh, we got played two NO teams because with our graduating class, which was going to become our graduating class, we had about a 130 kids in the graduating class would be the, uh, in uh, June of 1960. So we entered the NO League where uh, our numbers were comparable with, uh, you know, three of the schools there. And it was a good place to start our competition. 
And at that time, uh, two or three of those schools were very competitive, especially Medina under Pinky Glockland uh, had some great teams <laughs> and uh, some games <laughs> I still remember. What was the equipment like back then when you started off? Let me tell you a story. Uh, we had a business manager by the name, I'm not going to give you his name, doesn't matter. He was a good man. And of course, he passed a long time ago. He came to me early in uh, 1958 in September and said, Bill, I got a good deal for you. I'm getting these shoulder pads for $4.25 a piece, $4.25. He's very proud of that. At the end of two weeks, I had two kids with broken clavicles. So it was down to 24 kids. And uh, the superintendent at that time was a grassroots superintendent. He realized the problems and they did upgrade our shoulder pads. Uh, the kids didn't have game jerseys. Some of them just, uh, you know, put a number and I gave them numbers and they put them on their jersey. So they were pioneers. And uh, I, I think as they moved on through school and moved on through their life, they were very proud of that fact that they were the first. They had all these problems, no feel, no showers, no locker room, uh, stenciled shirts, whatever they could stencil them. Uh, not the greatest equipment, but uh, we were learning and our business manager was learning too. So it did improve, it did improve, no problem there. What type of offense uh, were you running and what were your defensive schemes back then? Yeah, uh, I was running a multiple offense. Naturally, uh, uh, well, Mickey Mudd was a coach at Michigan State when I uh, came up there. And by the way, I never thought I was going to college. I thought I was going to DuPont, where my father and my uncle and my aunt worked. But a guy named Matt Mazza, and you know the family, Matt, Vince, and OJ, he was one of our uh, assistant coaches at LaSalle. In May of 1951, he came to myself and a uh, young man from Niagara Falls High School and, and said, I'm going to send you boys up to Michigan State for a weekend. And, uh, well, the rest of the story is he sent both of us up there, and we had a great weekend. He introduced us to the uh, uh, current All-Americans. They just came off a good season. They only lost to Maryland in 1950. And we, you know, we were both 17 years old. Matter of fact, I uh, entered uh, Michigan State at 17, never turned 18th after my first season. But uh, any other uh, young man was the same as I was. But. Uh, I was amazed. And then before we left the weekend, they called us in one at a time and said, we'll uh, offer you uh, a half scholarship, tuition, out of state fees and books with the idea we'll give you a little job. And if you make the traveling squad in your sophomore year, because freshmen were not eligible in those days for varsity, we'll give you a full scholarship. I, I was elated for the guy that was not going to the college that nobody called me except, uh, I think that prep school up in uh, Rochester, Aquinas, made a phone call to me if I was interested uh, in being evaluated. That was about it. So here I am up at this campus, this beautiful campus, this team coming off a great season, meeting two of their All-Americans. Uh, one man made a big difference in my life, and that was Matt Mazza. Matt Mazza. Got a question for you. When you got, when Niagara Weefield moved over to the Niagara Frontier League, the NFL, what was going through your head at that point? And, and did we get in over our heads or was it a good league for you? Or Well, we were growing in uh, and we could see the baby boomers are starting to go through and we were going to do nothing but increase. And we we're going to increase us off right out of the Niagara Orleans League. It was a good move, but it was difficult for Coach Yergi. Uh, he did. He was an excellent coach, but he did what he could with the available talent and the uh, available numbers. And uh, he, he set the plate for uh, Armin Cacciatore that came in in 1970. But it, it was a difficult transition. Uh, were we ready for it yet? Maybe we could have spent a couple more years in the other league. But Mr. Rotella, who was our first director of athletics and a very good man, 
I always call him the father of our sports programs and our phys ed programs, felt that we want to take on the best. And we were taking on the best because we moved into the Frontier League at that particular time. And, and uh, in some of the sports, we competed very well. In football, we had some uh, long seasons and a couple decent years in the late 60s uh, on it. But it was, it was difficult. And I, I felt that we had good coaches. Now, another thing we didn't have, we never had a stadium. From 1958 to 1970, what we did when we played home, it was the old rope around the field and uh, 30 bleachers on one side and 30 bleachers on the other side and player benches. And that was it. Uh, many times we rented Hyde Park Stadium and played down there. And I, we might have rented a couple of the other fields that were available to us. I don't uh, remember that, but I remember Hyde Park Stadium on many occasions. So... Again, Coach Shirdy was dealing with a lot of problems, too. But uh, I thought he did a good job, set the place for Army Cacciatore. Army Cacciatore turned the whole, whole program around. And I think you know the rest of the story. He was at Rich Stadium five times, won three of them, two of them against John Feller, one of the best uh, football coaches in Western New York. And if you remember old Frankie Constantino from Depew, he beat him. And until Frankie died, he, uh, you used to always see me. When we ran into each other, why did I throw that pass at the 10-yard line? I don't know if you remember the story. The uh, pass was picked off by a kid named Grady Peterson who ran 90 yards, and that sold up the game against uh, Depew in our first shot at Rich Stadium, won the championship that year. We are also the number one team in uh, Section Secor, Western New York, number one, Gatchatory, 87. Great coach, but even greater than that, he was a role model. What, he talked the talk, he walked the walk. And uh, he was just a different type of person. And every uh, Saturday before a game, he'd take the kids to the church. It didn't matter. It could be a Lutheran church, it could be a Catholic church, whatever and then take the kids out for breakfast, uh, you know, afterwards, prior to the game. Uh, an honorable man, but a great role model. Matter of fact, uh, at Wheatfield, we had two great role models. And I bring this other name up only because he's the one that negotiated with Stu Barber for use of Rich Stadium for uh, the sectional playoffs. Stu Barber turned it down. You remember Eddie Rakowski? our old Notre Dame guy. And of course he was the head of the County at that time, the County exec, Fred Barone, administrator with me at Wheatfield, went to Ed Rakowski and Ed Rakowski said, yes. And that's how it all started at Rich Stadium. And then Fred, after a few years, turned it over to Chuck Funky and Chuck did a great job too. Uh, Niagara Wheatfield, the first few years um, in the Niagara Frontier League, was your rivals more towards North Tonawanda not, or the Niagara Falls schools? Or better yet, who were you, who became your rival? Uh, the number point? one rival was uh, Lewiston Porter. Was uh, Lewiston Porter. Certainly, uh, uh, NT was right on that line because if you beat NT, you know, you made a, a great accomplishment. Now, cats will never forget when we dedicated that stadium finally in 1971, in the name of Terry Harvey, a boy that was crippled against uh, North Tonawanda in 1960, October of 1969. When that stadium was dedicated that day in September uh, of uh, that year, 1971, NT beat us 54 nothing. It was a long day, let me put it that way. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure Cats didn't forget it. I didn't forget it. <laughs> and things like that. So, uh, but by 73, he was a co-champion of the league. <laughs> so he moved it along pretty good. Uh, and uh, and then, you know, teams kept improving. We were always up there. And, of course, uh, he, you know, did end up at Rich Stadium five times, won three of the five. Right. What are your memories about Terry Harvey? 
Terry Harvey, I had him in the uh, junior high. Uh, I had uh, so many darn assignments. When I got out of the Army, because I had to serve an ROTC, my ROTC commitment after I graduated from Michigan State, got out of the Army. I uh, went to uh, uh, Niagara Wayfield, and of course, I taught at the three little three of the little elementary schools, because we had no junior, senior high school. I uh, taught at the Tuscarora School, fifth and sixth grade, 39 little Native Americans. Then I went on to River Road School, which is a museum now next to the Frontier Fire Hall. That was my greatest teaching assignment, four women teachers and myself, and they made my lunch every day. You couldn't have it better than that. Then I went to Colonial Village, and... Uh, then the high school was open, moved up to the high school, and those were great days. Taught American history and civics, and of course, I started the football team. I had eight great years there at the high school. And after, after, then, you got, after you got out of coaching and you became an administrator, did you have any withdrawals from coaching? Uh, no, because I was so busy with um, other things. I supported the program all the way. And what I did when I moved into the uh, uh, junior high after I was there a few years and I was getting all the baby boomers begin to come through. Matter of fact, we went up to 1,475, if you can believe that. And the school only has about 1,150 now, the middle school. They don't call it the junior high no more. But I, I had uh, four lunch periods a day. I had the kids coming in on the bus in the morning. I had all of the discipline. I, I had half the evaluations, and uh, I was a busy guy, but I'd go to the games and watch the games and cheer the kids on and support uh, the uh, interscholastic program. Then I did one other thing. In 1970, I, I felt that we needed programs for the younger kids, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. I got some of my ex-ball players together, some of the parents together, the Dirty Dozen, and we started the Niagara Wheatfield Athletic Association in 1970. I uh, went to a Tyrone meeting, got a uh, membership there. We started with two teams. At the end of 71, we had five teams. And so I, I was involved with the association where we were really pushing the younger kids with a lot of athletic activities. Over the years, we got into wrestling, we got into lacrosse. It's still around after 50 years, but it's uh, the pandemic set it back a bit. Do you think that with uh, that anyone will ever beat Armand Cacciatore's coaching record in wrestling, 330 wins and Never. 30 losses? Never. And let me tell you a little story about that. When Armand came to us from Montana State, I was already in Whitfield a few years in the elementary schools and things like that, Todd. He came in and started the wrestling program. He had no gym to use. He'd have to roll the mats up in the cafeteria, roll the mats out every night. He started from scratch. I went down to Iroquois. It was the kingpin of wrestling then in 1961, that era, the early 60s. Cacciatore didn't do too well that first year. Two years later, he could beat Iroquois. In two years, he built that program. Remember, he had no gym. Every night, roll the mats out, roll the mats up, you know. And uh, by uh, the end of three years, he had one of the strongest, strongest programs in Western New York because he could beat Iroquois at that time. And Iroquois was the kingpin when he first started. It, it's amazing what he was able to accomplish in that time. And of course, he had big Franklin Patterson, 370 pounds, only could weigh him on a meat scale because we couldn't put him on a regular scale. And he's the one that just lay on you in the up position. You couldn't breathe. And <laughs> that was the end of you. He became uh, Catch's first uh, state champion. Catch had two others after that, Bobby Sloan and uh, Paul Cinchetti. No, they'll, you ask me a question? No. I don't think anybody can match his record ever or Lee and the uh, type of man he was. Do you think mm -hmm. that there'll be a time where the coaches are going to stay on for 10, 15, 20 years, or those days have gone by? I think uh, a lot of coaches don't want to dedicate themselves to that length of time. 
uh, for some, they, they love the game, whether it's football or soccer or whatever it is, boys or girls. But the, the long-term coach, uh, I think he lost a lot of – one of the reasons, too, is salaries are a lot better. When I started at Tuscarora School in 56, and I was glad to get it, $3,275. And I was glad to get that money. I had a nice apartment. I owned a car. It wasn't bad at all. But I think uh, because salaries are higher, they're now uh, some of them that might have – use that as one of the reasons to be involved have turned away, but you still have the diehard coaches. And I hope we never lose that percentage, but you made a good point. It, it uh, has fallen has without any question long-term. Looking back at you, at your career at Niagara weed fields, you ever sit back and, th and say to yourself, boy, that was a good run. I, well, Without any question, I had a good run. They, they were good to me out there. I had a great assignments. Uh, parents in those days, and remember, I was a dean of students at this Spadarian for a number of years. And I call up mom or whoever I could get or grandma, and we solved the problem. Uh, I was uh, a, little, a little different. <laughs> uh, when kids were skipping school, Especially when I remember at Colony Village, I told the principal, who was a nice man, I said, Ray, I'm going down. I know where these kids are. I know where they're hiding out today. And I remember saying, Bill, you shouldn't do that. I said, I'm on my lunch hour. I'm not taking away any school time. I go down there, knock at the door, bang it down. I say, I know you're in there. I said, like, get out. You're coming back to school. Now... <laughs> That type of situation uh, is not going to happen anymore. But in my day, you could do that. And uh, the kids knew I was <laughs> going to come after them, you know. And uh, I enjoyed myself. I, I, I taught at every level. I administrated at every level. I, I was even the principal for one year in 1994-95 uh, uh, for 14 months of the high school. When our principal, who was an outstanding principal, uh, contacted uh, a serious ailment and I took over there. But at that time, you know, I was up in age and I had the opportunity to take a school as principal. I said, no, I want to go back to my job as the director of athletics and phys ed and whatever else you give me. But I, I haven't told you the rest of the story here. When I moved over to the athletic director's position, when that other gentleman got sick with the ailment, the knee, acute knee, a knee situation. I thought I was only going over there for a few months, helping out both ways. Still had my hand on the junior high and my hand on the other. But before I knew it, I, uh, you know, was full time over there. And really, I, I was looking for an elementary principalship. I went back to school, got my master's in elementary administration supervision and got all the certifications that I needed from New York State. But uh, it didn't turn out that way, and that, and uh, I'm glad it didn't. It it gave me a lot more challenges, and I uh, made a lot of good friends over those years. And uh, you asked me if it was a good run. Yeah, it was a great run, without any question. But I didn't bring up one point. I was elated because I was only going to be the director of athletics, phys ed, and recreation. A new superintendent came in. In 1978, and he uh, called me down at his office. He says, Bill, with your uh, thir almost 13 years administration, I want you to be 50% assistant principal at the high school and 50% director of athletics and phys ed. Now, remember, we're in a school. <laughs> and I said, well, it's not much I could say. I said, OK. And uh, so I had two offices. I could have a suspension at eight o'clock in the morning and change in a schedule in my other office at nine o'clock in the morning. But because I had all of those years as an administrator, it was an easy transition for me. So I can't ever complain. But let me tell you, it kept me busy running from office to office because you never know, hey, there's a fight in that A-wing and I'm doing something in athletics and I have to run down to A-wing to take care of the fight. It was it was an interesting journey, but a great 47 years.
let me ask you this. Um, how did the, the advent of Title IX, how did that affect your job and, and athletics at, at Niagara Wheatfield? Only ran into one problem there. That's a good question, too. I had a girls volleyball coach that said I was more partial to the boys volleyball team than to hers. She wrote me up on it. And I, I just wasn't. And so they sent in a, a federal uh, representative and he went in all over the records and the uh, orders for equipment and supplies and everything else. And at the end of the day, I got a letter of uh, clearance. So that was the only problem I ran into. And to this day, I like this teacher. She's a good phys ed teacher, good volleyball coach, but she still turned me in. And uh, I had to work my way through that, but I had all the answers. I had all the paperwork. You then moved on to politics. You became a Niagara County legislator. Yeah, I, I, I took my first shot back in 79 because in college, I was a major in history, a major in political science. I had a double major, a minor in phys ed so I could coach sometime. So I always liked political science. And in 79, I ran for council in town Niagara. I lived in town Niagara at that time. I was elected and uh, I spent a good four years, enjoyed it all. And then I moved to Wheatfield. And naturally, I completed my term in town Niagara. I stayed out for about three or four years. And then I got a call that they wanted me to run for uh, legislator. And I, I really was hemming and hawing on it. I think my wife heard the call. She, this was a sitting right next to me when I got the call. Then I said, no, I, I said, I'll, I'll take a shot at it and took a shot at it. And uh, I was elected in 1987, moved in in uh, 1988 and was elected. <laughs> the end of the second year was elected uh, chairman by default. Let me tell you what happened. John Pallack was running for it, was a good legislator. John from North Carolina was very good. And Dick Shanley, who was the chairman, was running for it. So we all tied in votes. So by uh, state uh, law, uh, by February 1st, then, it's turned over to the county clerk. And he decides who's going to be chairman. And we were all three of us were interviewed by the county clerk. And a, a good man, he was county clerk for years. And I said, well, these guys have the experience. I mean, they're both good legislators. They called me in and said, you are the interim <laughs> county chairman. So that started it. And uh, well, it didn't last long because at that time I was a, a Democrat and the Republicans took over and Lee Simonson, who was a great uh, county legislator, uh, was the uh, county chairman for the next four years. But I got to add to the story. I had a, a young man in the class of 70 over at uh, Niagara Wheatfield, one of the Burkholz boys, one of the uh, German boys over here. And he ran against me uh, in 93 and the uh, student beat the teacher. So with great humility, <laughs> I learned a lesson, but he was a great young man. He did a good job. Now, the only reason I got back to the legislator, I'll be very honest with you, he decided to become the highway superintendent because a good uh, Italian Catholic boy finds it hard to beat a German Lutheran boy in the Burkholz area over here. So I was glad he decided to become a, uh, a highway superintendent, gave my chance for a shot, and I had some good years in there, enjoyed that. I, I like government. I like government and uh, I, I, I only can say I enjoyed my tenure and I was fortunate to, to be elected by the people in, in my areas. What was more difficult, being a, a, a teacher, an administrator or a politician? Well, during the election, you know, when you're running for election, it, it's tough. But once you're in there, it's just the idea of making sure you're prepared for every uh, meeting. You don't want to be stripped in a meeting, if you know what I mean. Um, it, that difficult period is when you go through the primary, if you got a primary and go through general election. So you have a six month period there that uh, can be very difficult and very time consuming. But when you get into it, you get engrossed in it. The, 
with county legislator, it's, you know, every, uh, every two years. So uh, the first year you get a lot done, the second year you're prepping to run again and things like that. But um, enjoyed it. It couldn't have been a better avocation. And uh, that's another thing I have to thank uh, my coaches and my sports supporters, and my timers and my supervision. I could do a lot of things that I wouldn't ordinarily be able to do at night if it wasn't for their loyalty to me. I could trust them uh, and give them their job and they do their job. So uh, to have these advocations, I'd have to thank uh, the people that uh, I put in those positions and I put them in the positions because they wanted to be there and uh, the loyalty they had to me. And uh, I, I deeply appreciate that. Was able to do things that I probably would not nearly be able to do. They named, at Niagara Weefield, they named the athletic complex after you. What does that mean to you? Uh, it means an awful lot. When I can remember when we used to pick stones out of there <laughs> in 1959, when we finally started using that field and uh, what it looked like and what it looks like today to have that beautiful complex named after me. The student athletes I had uh, over the years and then just as soon as I had now that they had this beautiful complex that they were kind enough, the administration, to name after me. Yes, it's a good feeling because there's a lot of people in my uh, as I think back, that certainly they could have named the complex after. Without any question. Yes, I'm very proud of that. You've enjoyed a great career in different aspects. I gotta ask well, you this. I gotta ask you this. How do you want to be remembered? Well, I want to be uh, remembered that uh, I was always willing to help uh, students. I was a hard nose, you know. Uh, you hear some of the stories about me, but kids stop me today kids, their 40s, their 50s. Mr. Ross, I wish we had somebody like you again for my kids in school and things like that. Uh, it's amazing how many will stop me. And I stopped them right there. I said a lot of rules and regulations on state education department have changed. People like me don't exist no more because they can't exist. They're, they have to check some balances out and but I said, I'm, I'm glad you feel that way. And it makes me feel very, uh, very happy. Only one person has ever stopped me in top store over in Niagara Falls. I was, after church one day, I was in there getting something. This girl came up to me. Are you Mr. Ross? I said, yeah. She says, you know, in a cafeteria, you accused me of doing something that I never did. I thought she was going to laugh about it. She didn't laugh. <laughs> she was serious. Now, remember, this is 20 years later, 25. So I said to her, if I was wrong, I apologize to you. But that's the only one I can ever remember. She really took me to task on that Sunday morning on that. But uh, I probably did. I certainly made my share of mistakes. And, uh, and most of the kids probably forgiven me, the ones I did make mistakes with. We've but, talked uh, one last final question. We, we talked a lot of, about different things right here. What would you like to talk about that I haven't brought up? Uh, really, well, you know, uh, another thing I had going at the same time, after I got off active duty, I went to active reserves. And uh, I stayed in that for 26 years, a total of 28 years before I retired. And, and again, the, uh, the administration was very good to me. I never abused it because under uh, New York state law, you can get 30 days a year. I never took that. And my, my wife would tell you, I used to take my vacation days to go on active duty during the uh, summer. I, uh, I would not uh, put in, although I was eligible to put in for the 30 days because I thought they were uh, so good to me. I, I just couldn't do that. So I, I, again, uh, you know, I got those days I was away, usually two weeks. Uh, I had people that would fill for me if anything needed to be uh, done during that time. But I, and I can check the records over at Wakefield. My wife will tell you, I took personal days or uh, vacation days. But that's another thing that Niagara Wheatfield was very, very good about. 
about letting me fulfill my requirements and retire, and uh, which I did as a lieutenant colonel a good many years ago. Bill Ross, I want to thank you so much for joining me here today. It was wonderful. It was wonderful to meet you, listening to your stories and recollection of the days gone by at Niagara Weefield. I wish you well. I wish you good health. And thank you so much. Well, thank you, too. Happy, healthy uh, new year for 2022.